Hi everybody, it's Christina Wallace and this is Human Anatomy and Physiology 2 lab at Clackamas Community College and today we're going to be talking about the respiratory system. So uh, a little bit about respiratory anatomy, um, lots of respiratory histology, and a little bit about respiratory physiology. So first things first, here we are at the online instructions and um, uh, Professor Patterson has done a great job of putting materials together for this lab, so there are, are many things I'm going to depend on his links for and that I'm not going to go over in detail in my own slideshow. Um, and the, the FIS video right here is a great video and I'll show you a little bit about what that is. So when you click on this link you get to this video. Um, look at how the air moves from one place to the next and so this is what we're going to take a look at uh, starting from the head because so I just wanted you to see this is the video he does a great job of going over this model you will see this model on an exam so be able to compare this model to the picture in your lab manual um, which I'll show you in just a second and here's the picture out of your lab book and I have included the link on this page just so it's very simple to find. Because the video does such a great job of going over all the anatomy, I'm going to let them do that. So the next part of your lab manual on page two has you looking at the histology of the trachea. And so this is just a picture out of your book and I just kind of want to go over a few structures. Um, so this area is the trachea and this in the blue is the esophagus. So our trachea um, consists of this blue part right here. This is the hyaline cartilage C ring. And you can tell that it doesn't go all the way around. This part right here that I just circled in blue is the smooth muscle. Um, and that's the part that uh, leans up against your esophagus. And so when you swallow food, it doesn't go bump, 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 bump down the rings of your trachea. That smooth muscle is there to allow a big bolus of food to go down your esophagus without bumping against the rungs of your trachea. Um, so it's lined with an epithelium, so on the inside surface we're going to have pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. The purpose of this tissue is to secrete mucus and it has goblet cells in it, which I'll show you on other pictures. Um, underneath, because you can't ever glue epithelium directly onto muscle or glands or something, you have to have some connective tissue, so you have some lamina propria behind it, so this kind of little area here is the lamina propria. And then you're going to have an area of submucosa that is below that, and in the submucosa we're going to have serum mucus glands. So all of these funky things are serum mucus glands. And then going ba um, backwards down the line, we're going to get to the hyaline cartilage. And so all of this is hyaline cartilage. And you can see those little uh, chondrocytes living in the lacunae, and they look kind of like um, black-eyed peas. That's standard hyaline cartilage. So let's look at that histologically now. Um, so this is the exact same picture from uh, histologyguide.com. You can go there and zoom in on things if you want. Um, so here we have the C-ring of hyaline cartilage. Then we're going to have the smooth muscle that um, next to where your esophagus would sit, remember. And your esophagus would be like out here somewhere. Esophagus. Um, we're going to see our epithelium on the inside right there, and then there's going to be some lamina propria in the yellow area, and then you're going to have serum mucus glands. I'm circling the serum mucus glands in blue, serum mucus glands. Then you're going to hit the cartilage, then you're going to hit um, adventitia on the outside in the yellow, adventitia. So here is our pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium, and it is this stuff right here. This stuff. 
There's going to be um, some cilia on the top of those cells. And these are actually motile cilia, and they cause what's called a mucus elevator. And so particles of dust and stuff, um, I'm going to pick another color here, um, particles of dust and stuff get trapped in this mucus, right? So my green particles are particles of dust. And then these little cilia, these little cilia right here, are going to um, help move those particles up and out so you can cough them up or swallow them mucus elevator. And so your PCCE secretes mucus and helps to collect dirt and particles so that they don't go into the small alveoli of your lungs. And then here are goblet cells. There's a goblet cell right there, there's a goblet cell right there, and so just more mucus producing cells interspersed amongst your pseudostratified columnar cells. The lamina propria is just directly under the epithelium, and so this stuff right here, lamina propria. Once we get down kind of over here, we're kind of into the submucosa, and so while this yellow layer right now looks pretty thick, it's generally not very thick. Uh, lamina propria is connective tissue that helps to kind of glue your epithelium onto underneath structures. It goes in between your epithelium and uh, deeper structures. Seromucous glands, again, serous fluids, mucus fluids. That's where the name comes from, seromucous. And so again, these glands, all of these glands are going to secrete stuff that goes out to the surface and helps to make your mucus elevator work to uh, collect particles before they go into the small areas of your lungs. And then once again, the smooth muscle, so all of this tissue that I'm outlining in yellow is the smooth muscle of your trachea and uh, <clears throat> your esophagus would be kind of out that direction somewhere. We can see a tiny bit, I'll circle in blue, there's a tiny bit of hyaline cartilage over here, so we're getting just the end of the C-ring, but generally this smooth muscle right here um, exists in the area where there is no hyaline cartilage ring. So the next part of your uh, histology study on page two is to look at basic lung tissue. And so this is a wide view of lung tissue. Um, all of this stuff out here is generally uh, alveoli. Um, these are, this is where the gas exchange um, occurs. And so it's just a bunch of little sacs. So here's a little sac, here's a little sac. Little individual sacs are alveoli, and they're lined with capillary beds. And this is where the gas exchange in your lungs occurs, alveoli, alveoli. In this view, we can also see a couple of bronchioles. And so I'll do those in blue. So we have a bronchial right there. We have a bronchial right there. And I can tell that because of the dark purple epithelium, that's PCCE. And we'll contrast that with blood vessels, which are here. Those are arteries and veins. And we'll see, we'll zoom in on those and look at the epithelium a little bit too. So uh, lung, lung structures are gonna have PCCE. Um, if it's any sort of conducting tube. Alveoli have simple squamous epithelium, and blood vessels also are lined with simple squamous epithelium, and we'll see that in the next slide. So here's a closer view of those structures. And so once again, this, this is a bronchiole with its PCCE epithelium. Um, and this is a blood vessel with its simple squamous epithelium. And so those are two ways we can tell tubes apart. And then you have, um, you know, an alveolus, an alveolus, an alveolus. These are all the gas exchange parts of your lungs. And so compare this, look at the link 
on the instruction page and compare this healthy lung to an, uh, a lung with emphysema and see what the difference is between the size of the alveolar sacs. So all the pictures that I took of the lung were from this normal lung on histologyguide.com. And then you have this slide right here, or this link that shows you uh, a lung with emphysema. And just notice the changes between those two. Um, the next part of your lab um, talks about how your lungs are filled and what the, the relationship is between volume and pressure. And so the bell jar experiment, um, and its corresponding video right there um, should help you understand that better. So I'm gonna let them do that and I'm not gonna talk about it much. And then the last video uh, link that Professor Patterson has given you is one about spirometry. And so this video right here is the spirometer. Um, this is how we measure certain um, lung volumes, like how much air do you take in in a regular breath? How much air do you take in when you inhale as much as you can? How much air do you um, exhale if you exhale as much as you can? Um, and it's a great video. It's super fun and it's very informative, so I urge you to watch that. That's where you'll get spirometer information. I'm not going to talk about it. What I am going to spend a little bit of time on is the acid-base balance. And so page seven of your lab, pardon me, page seven of your lab has stuff about acid-base balance. And so I'm gonna go and talk about that. Well, first, let me tell you just a couple things about um, spirometer volumes. Um, first off, all of these things that are called um, volumes, all of this stuff right here, these are things that you would measure by blowing into a tube or inhaling through a tube. Once you get to talking about respiratory capacities, that's this stuff right here. Then we're talking about some sort of equation where we're adding these things together in different combinations. So capacities are additions uh, or, or equations made of volumes. And just quickly, your tidal volume, this yellow stripe in the middle, this one right here, that's kind of your regular inhale and exhale. Um, and then your expiratory reserve volume in the blue is if you uh, forcibly exhale as much as you can, that, that's how much air you would exhale 1200 mils. Um, and then residual volume at the bottom, this stuff right here never ever exits. It's always there. So you can't breathe out or exhale the residual volume. Otherwise your lungs would suck together like a vacuum and your trachea would suck together like a vacuum and that doesn't occur. So there's always some air left in our lungs even when we've exhaled a whole bunch. So note as you're going through the lab that um, on this first page, page five, it gives you, he gives you some data. So this respirations per minute number, you're gonna take on to the next page. And so here we go, right here. Um, 15 from previous page. So you're just going to find averages of numbers and plug them into your formulas, pretty simple. All right, so now let's talk about the acid-base balance of your blood. Um, your, your body stays at a really strict pH range. And so this pH range right here, this like never wavers. And if you go over, if you get to 7.5, you die. If you get to 7.3, you die. So it's a very, we have to have a very good buffer system in order to counter the acids that build up when, um, from CO2 respiration, um, et cetera. Here in the middle is our first kind of look at the uh, carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system. And so, um, and you can see pictures of this um, in your lab manual in exercise 37 in a big red blood cell. And I'll get to that in a minute too. Um, all right, but so here's how it works. You have water and CO2, CO2 from your cells or CO2 that you are uh, building up because you're not exhaling it. Those combine um, and in the red blood cell, 
um, they use carbonic anhydrase. If they're in the plasma, they don't have carbonic anhydrase to speed up the process, so they go much slower. Um, when those two, when all of that happens, you're going to get this intermediate, um, and this is carbonic acid. H2CO3 is carbonic acid. And it, it um, will form, but it'll form and disassociate very easily, so it's kind of an intermediate step. Um, and then um, all the way to the right of this, when um, carbonic acid breaks down, it's going to break down into free hydrogen ions and bicarbonate um, ions. And so those are the two things that this becomes when it breaks down. And so that's what all of this is about. So bicarbonate ions diffuse out of the red blood cells into the plasma. So by, that's how we get the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer, buffer system in the plasma, is those bicarbonate ions exit the red blood cell. Remember, we're in the red blood cell up here. Um, and this, this goes into the plasma to neutralize any free hydrogen ions that are floating around in the plasma. And free hydrogen ions equals acid. So it's, a, it's protons hanging out, H pluses. If you have a whole bunch of free H pluses, you get hydro, you get hydro acids and they are, can be very destructive. And so we need to be, have uh, ways to neutralize them. And that's what uh, bicarbonate does. So if we get hydrogen ions building up in the blood and uh, the blood's getting more and more acidic, it will hook up with um, bicarbonate to form carbonic acid. And so it basically takes these hydrogen ions and sequesters them, puts them in a form so they're not just hanging out being acidic, you know? Um, and so if our blood gets too basic, and we need to add some hydrogen ions all by themselves, then we're going to break down this carbonic acid into hydrogen and bicarbonate. And then we have a bunch of free H's hanging out, and they will help to lower the pH if it gets too alkaline. Um, and this has to do with breathing because, as you see in the top, um, CO2, CO2 is a main raw material for this equation. And so if by breathing we increase the amount of CO2 in our, in our um, respiratory system, we're going to push this equation to the right. And we're going to end up making our, the environment more acidic. And so that's kind of what the bottom of this page is talking about. So in, and I've put some notes in here, I think that are useful. So if you are breathing shallowly, if you are hypoventilated, that means that you're not exhaling lots of CO2. So there's more CO2 available to serve as a raw material for that equation. And so it will move the equation to the right creating more free hydrogen ions and making the environment more acidic. Got it? And so if um, we're going the other direction, let me see, I need a new color. I'll do green. Um, if we are breathing fast and deep, we're exhaling lots of our CO2, so we don't have that raw material. So we have less CO2 available um, and so when you're hyperventilating, this is why you breathe into a paper bag um, so that you can kind of get back some of that CO2 and create a balance. And so if you are hyperventilating, um, you don't have a lot of CO2, and so we can't really go to the left, uh, go to the right anymore. We don't have those raw materials. And so it will push the equation to the left causing those free hydrogens to hook up with bicarbonates to form that carbonic acid. And so this traps the free H's so that we can lower the pH, or so we can raise the pH, we can make the environment less acidic. So again, 
If we don't have enough CO2, we're going to go to the left with our equation. And if we have lots of CO2, we're going to go to the right with our equation and end up more acidic. And that's pretty much the whole deal with the buff bicarbonate buffer system. And so then you just have some data to look at. We would have done this experiment in the classroom. Um, and so you're basically, um, with this experiment, you're going to be comparing how distilled water um, is, how it works compared to a standardized buffer. And so that's kind of what our experiment is set up. So we have some samples with distilled water, distilled water, distilled water. And then we have some samples with buffers. And so you're going to be adding drops of, of acidic things and drops of basic things and you're going to be kind of looking at these values over here to see what happens when you do that and to see how well distilled water works to keep a constant pH because remember our body can can't vary from that 7.4 very much like 7.35 to 7.45 that's the range and we can't go higher or lower than that so we need a really good buffer system um, because we're so full of water we need something better than water and so that's kind of what we're testing with this experiment right here what's better than water um, and so we're going to look at a standard buffer solution, and so we get some values using a standard buffer solution. And so that's what those are right there. And then we're going to add even more drops of basic and acidic stuff to these two beakers, and we're going to see what happens, right? And so those are the values. That's what we got when we added even more acidic and basic things to those two buffers. And so you're kind of comparing... Um, this number that, that you see in three and four here to the changes up here and drawing some conclusions about them. On the next page you see the um, page 558 and 559 in your lab manual right here. Um, this is the picture from that, and this equation right here in the red blood cell, that's the whole equation. And so when we talk about things moving to the right, we're going this direction, and we'll end up with more acidic stuff. And um, that takes lots of CO2 as a raw material, and if we don't have CO2, we're going to be going more this direction and generating more carbonic acid so that we sequester those free hydrogens and reduce uh, or uh, increase the pH, reduce the acid levels. And then just a little hint, I just gave you an example um, on questions five and six, uh, which, which of its parts, so parts of the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system in the plasma um, resists the drop in pH. So it's the bicarbonate ion that resists the drop in pH. And how does it do that? It combines with hydrogen ions to form the intermediate, thus removing those free hydrogen ions. And so we, um, we can't, the pH won't drop too much. And so using that logic, um, same logic, figure out what parts resist a rise in pH. So how do we create acid when we need it? And that's pretty much your lab for this week. Thank you.